Now, we are going to get the pressure at this particular point in this liquid. This point is directly below the surface of the liquid. The vertical distance to the surface, or the depth, is h. To get the pressure at this point, we consider the pressure on a horizontal circle of radius r centered at this point. So we just think of some small circle centered at the point. Now let's look at this view here. We will refer to our circle as a, a little sliver whose thickness is negligible. So we will call this sliver S. Okay, let's get the downwards force on this sliver. Now, um, it seems fairly intuitive actually that the downward force on the sliver is equal to the weight of the column of liquid above the sliver. So the column of liquid above the sliver is in the shape of a cylinder of radius r and height h. So it looks like we multiply the mass of the column m by g to get the weight of the column of liquid, which in turn is the downward force on this sliver s. Now, as a quick aside, I want to actually prove that fact. Um, this can be skipped if you like, um, but I think it's worth proving. I don't think it's 100% clear. Um, to prove that the downward force on S equals the weight of liquid above S, we need to use a mixture of Newton's third and second laws and consider the contact forces between S and the column C. All right, so obviously the top face of the sliver is in contact with this column of li liquid. So we can write this downward force as the force on S due to C. The force on the sliver due to the column of liquid. It's a contact force that acts at right angles to um, the surface of contact of the column, well, the bottom of the column and the top of the sliver. Now the sliver is so thin actually that um, we won't have to worry about pressure changing with depth over the um, height of the sliver because it's so thin that its height is effectively zero. Okay, so now we can apply Newton's third law. We have a force on S due to C, so that means we have an equal and opposite force on C due to S. So FSC is equal to minus vector FCS. Now, I will show vector FCS in blue because I'm showing the column C in blue. So this is a force on the column now. This force here is not acting on S. Um, I could have maybe just raised up its tail a bit just to make that clear that it's not acting on S. It's acting on the column. Okay, so this is vector FCS. Force on C due to S. Okay, so these are contact forces. Um, now, next we will apply Newton's second law to the column. The column is in equilibrium. That means that its acceleration is zero. Okay, what's the other force acting on the column? Well, we have its weight. The weight of the column, as we know, is vertically down. And it's got magnitude mg. Now there's no other vertical forces acting on the column. We do have horizontal forces acting on it, but they cancel out because the column is in not just vertical, but also horizontal equilibrium. Um, the horizontal forces don't come into this. So by Newton 2, um, A is zero. And if A is zero, it means the resultant force on the column is zero. So if the resultant force on the column is zero, it means that the vectors acting up on the column equal in magnitude to the vector acting down. So the vector acting up is FCS in magnitude, and that must equal the weight of the column Mg. But now we're nearly done. If FCS is equal to Mg, then FSC is equal to Mg. So remember, these two vectors have the same magnitude. Opposite in direction, but the same magnitude. So FCS equals FSC. So now we see that the magnitude of this vector here is indeed equal to the weight of the column of liquid above S. So this vector is mg. Now we are in a position to get the pressure on S. We are going to assume here that um, 
the force, the downward force on S is evenly distributed over the top surface of S. Okay, so, you know, Mg is the resultant of lots of force vectors of equal magnitude and direction. Okay, so they're all pointing vertically down. And if we sum all these force vectors, we get Mg. All right, so what do we do? Well, we take the force on S, the downward force on S, and divide by the area. Well, what's the area of a circle? It's pi times the radius squared. Now, from previous videos, we saw how to connect the mass of a substance to its density and volume. We saw that mass is just density multiplied by volume. And rho here is the density of the liquid, assumed to be uniform. The density is the same everywhere. Now what about V? Well, V is the volume of the column. Well, the column is in the shape of a cylinder. What's the volume of a cylinder? It's pi r squared times h. The cross-sectional area pi r squared times the height. Now, notice something interesting here. Notice that the pressure on S does not depend on the radius because the radius cancels out. Um, the pi's go out as well, but that's not important. We can see that the pressure, well, it depends on the density, but the density is the same everywhere in the liquid, but it varies with the height. It varies linearly with the height. G is just a constant. So we can see that the pressure P is proportional to the height. So if we double the height, we double the pressure. If we triple the height, we triple the pressure. Okay, the pressure is just a constant times the height, where the constant is given by rho g. So if we're given our density, and uh, g is obviously a given, so this thing is really just a constant. And if we're interested in the, how the pressure varies with h, well, it varies linearly. Pressure equals a constant times h. But the big thing about this is that it doesn't depend on the radius of s. It doesn't matter how small r is. So this means that even if r approaches zero, the density is given by rho g h. So we can imagine a circle centered at our point with tiny radius, a radius that's practically zero. And the density, or the pressure on S, the tiny circle, which is indistinguishable from the point, is rho g h. So we could say that this is the pressure at the point, the point at the center of S. Again, this comes from the fact that these R's cancel, so it doesn't matter how small R is, it disappears from this formula. When R approaches zero, we essentially get a pint. So this is the pressure at a pint in the liquid, at a depth H below the surface. We considered the downward force acting on S, but S is in equilibrium, its acceleration is zero. So by Newton's second law, the resultant force on S is zero. So that means that we must have an equal upwards force of magnitude mg acting on S. We must always remind ourselves that um, m is not the mass of S. S is essentially no mass because S has no thickness. m is the mass of the column of liquid above S. Okay, so let's take a particle in a liquid, the particles in equilibrium. Um, we have fo a force acting down on the particle, counterbalanced by an equal force acting up on the particle. The magnitude of these forces depend on the depth of the particle. Okay, so if we double the depth, we double the force. And hence we double the pressure at this point. We double the force, we double the pressure. But the pressure is not a vector. The pressure is a scalar. The pressure doesn't have any direction. So what I'm showing here are force vectors. Okay, this arrow, this vector does not represent pressure. It's the force on the particle. Now, this particle is in contact with liquid to its left. So there's a contact force on the particle. So we have a force on the particle in, in this direction. But for equilibrium, we must have an equal and opposite force. Okay, these two forces have the same magnitude. We have uh, liquid 
above this point here pushing down on the particle so we have a force in this direction and for equilibrium we must have an equal opposite force in this direction okay this is for equilibrium now this we are applying Newton's second law the acceleration of the particle is zero so the resultant force on the particle is zero okay so we've all these forces um, we don't know anything about their magnitudes. Well, we do know that the um, downward force has the same magnitude as the upward force. It just c comes from considering the forces on S, okay? But of course, we're letting R approach zero. So that doesn't change anything. We saw that already. Um, R cancels out in the derivation. So these f forces up and down have the same magnitude. But what about the forces acting in other directions? What kind of magnitudes do they have? It can be shown, and we won't show it in this video, that the force on a particle in all directions has the same magnitude. So these vectors have the same magnitude as these two. So I'm just showing a few of the force vectors acting on the particle and they all have the same magnitude. Now let's consider two points at equal depth h in this container of liquid. According to our formula the pressure should be the same. The pressure depends on the density of the liquid and depth h. Both points are at the same depth so the pressure should be the same at both of these points. And it actually is. Um, of course, above this point here, we have a smaller column of liquid than we have above this point here. So we might um, assume that the force, the downward force on this particle here is greater than the downward force on this particle here. Now it turns out that that's false. It turns out that the downward force on both particles is the same, as long as that they're at the same depth h which means in turn that the pressure is the same at both of these points. Now I won't prove this but what we can do is to get an idea of why this might be true notice that the container exerts a pressure on this column of liquid in the downward direction. So to get the downward force on this particle we must not only consider the weight of the column of liquid above this particle but also the downward force contact force of the container on the liquid. Whereas over here we have a greater weight of liquid above this particle but we don't have any contact force of the container on the top of this column of liquid. So it turns out that the forces on both of these particles is the same which means in turn that the pressure is the same. So the pressure everywhere on this horizontal line is constant and given by rho gh.